I was very glad to see you at the service tonight. Uh, we're going to commence uh, the, the worship of the Lord this Sabbath evening with the hymn 215. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not, my Lord was crucified. Knowing not it was for me, he died on Calvary. 215, and um, we'll stand together as we sing, please. just turn to the Lord together in prayer. We'll lift our hearts to him for the service tonight. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we approach thee in our Savior's great name. Thank you for the opportunity to enter into your most sacred presence. We come, Father, in the attitude of prayer. We recognize that we need the help of God tonight. Never a time that we feel our weakness more than at that time, Father, when we uh, come to call upon thee in prayer. We ask that you'll come and sustain us tonight. We want to pray, Father, you'll lead us even now in our prayers. We want to pray that the Spirit of God will come down upon the meeting. Our prayer, Father, is that you'll lead us on as a congregation, lead us on especially at the throne of heavenly grace. We ask thee to come and uh, guide us through the service tonight. Pray you'll lead us in this meeting in every part. We're mindful, Father, 
of the blessings that we've known today already. We thank you for even health and strength that allows us to come uh, to the service tonight. We praise thee, Father, for that strength of body, strength of mind. Thank you, Father, for the meetings this morning, the Sunday school, the Bible classes. We praise thee for the liberty, the opportunity that we have to meet and to worship thee. Pray, Father, that you'll use your word that has gone forth. We pray for this, the saving of the souls of all the boys and girls and the young people. We want to ask, Father, that you'll increase the number of the children and the young people. We ask thee to add to, to the Sunday school classes. We ask thee, Father, to add to our children's meetings uh, as well. May the blessing of God in all their fullness, in all its fullness rest upon every department of this church. We do want to thank you, Father, for the visitors that you've been bringing in, even as a response of the outreach that has been carried out. And Lord, we want to pray that you'll bring in other visitors. Uh, we thank you for answering the prayers of the congregation here. And Lord, we pray it might be the beginning of many that will come in from this city. We're conscious that you've your people all across this city and even all across this community, from differing backgrounds, even differing nationalities. And Lord, we want to pray that you'll draw in a people, even to the testimony of the gospel here uh, in this place. Your word says that the Lord knoweth uh, them that are his. And Lord, remember that you gave that great promise to the apostle Paul when he was ministering in the city of Corinth. You said that I have much people in this city. Lord, we take that promise tonight. We want to claim it, want to stand upon it. Lord, we believe that you have a people for your name in this great city of Armagh. We want to lift this city up before thee tonight. We want to pray, Father, for the blessing of God to be upon the work of the gospel here in this city. We're asking, Lord, that you'll come and visit us with revival. Even tonight, Father, may the Spirit of God come down in an unusual way, in a new way upon us. We pray that this will be a Holy Ghost uh, anointed gospel service. We want to pray that you'll bless the word of God that will go forth. Lord, our prayer is that this building will ever be uh, the birthplace of souls. We pray that it will be ever set apart to that great and to that sacred task. Lord, it's our prayer, our desire to be soul winners. We ask thee to hear our cries, uh, Father, even to that end. We want to pray that you'll bless our lives and bless our efforts in the winning of many uh, to the Savior. We pray, Father, that you'll lead us as a congregation, even into great uh, days of blessing. We remember, Father, this day, uh, the, the birthday of uh, the great Protestant Reformation. We think of your servant, Martin Luther. We thank you for the memory of him, even, Father, now, after half a millennium, more than 500 years later, and Lord, we want to pray uh, that you'll rekindle even those days of great blessing once more. We want to pray that there'll be the pulling down of Satan's strongholds, even again in our own day and in our generation. We see, Father, uh, the wickedness that is arising uh, all around us. And Lord, we're pleading with thee uh, to be mindful of this land and to be mindful of this province that has been so blessed and the preaching of the gospel has been so owned even of God uh, in this land. Lord, we pray there might even be a rekindling in the hearts of your people of an interest of all of the great events of those days of the Protestant Reformation. And Lord, as we think of the mighty power that was displayed then, we remember that you're the same God, that no change uh, Jehovah knows. Lord, come again Meg, bear your arm. Uh, come again, we pray, and make bear your power uh, even amongst us. Lord, we can hear the explosions of the fireworks around this city, but we remember there's a power uh, that your word speaks of that's even greater, and that is the power of the gospel. You, the, the, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation uh, to everyone that believeth. And Lord, our cry uh, tonight as a congregation, our prayer, our earnest and united prayer, is that the power of the gospel will be felt 
and displayed across this city, across this county, and even across uh, this land, uh, even in, in coming days. We remember those young men uh, taking up the ministry of the gospel, remember in Rosharkin in London, and in Ochnacloy, our neighboring congregation. Lord, lead the work of God on in those places. Lord, it's our desire uh, that the kingdom of Christ would be extended in every one of those places. Uh, Lord, save us uh, even uh, from jealousy from one congregation to another. If we see God at work and the blessing of God being experienced, Lord, our land in every corner, every corner of your vineyard needs to see the blessing of God in all its fullness uh, resting upon us. Give us a heart. We pray for the work. Give us a heart. We ask for the whole of the work of God and the whole of the work of the gospel. We thank you that our moderator and our clerk have been busy these last few weeks in ordaining and installing men, young men, to the ministry of the gospel. We rejoice in that, Father, and we want to pray that as a presbytery we'll be busier still in coming days in training young men and young women for the work of God and for the, the mission fields and sending forth uh, heralds of the gospel across this land and even uh, across the earth. Thank you, Father, uh, for what we've been singing together tonight of oh, that, that place called Calvary. And Lord, we want to pray even for a vision of Calvary, the greatness of your love. Mercy there was great and grace was free. We thank you for the greatness of your grace. We thank you for the vastness of your mercy that ever reached down and saved our souls. And Lord, we want to pray, display your grace and display your mercy even amongst us tonight. So we ask you just to, to hear our cries and be with us, uh, be amongst us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to read together uh, some verses from the New Testament Scriptures. We're reading in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Remember, these are what are known as the pastoral epistles. 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus. They help us much with regard to the work of God. They help us with regard to life in the church. And they speak about the offices of the church. They speak about setting young men apart uh, for the work of the ministry. Uh, Monday week will be the 27th anniversary of my ordination. It took place in Tandragee. We were in Wales at that time. Uh, after a couple of years, Mr. Paisley visited to the opening of the building in Burryport and came back uh, to the presbytery with a report of all that was going on and felt that the presbytery should ordain us for the work there in Wales. So they brought us home uh, to Roberta's home congregation. Martyrs was my home congregation at that time, uh, still would be. Uh, but they were in a building program and weren't able to accommodate uh, the ordinations who took place in Tandragee. Uh, I had read the life of Oswald J. Smith. I found his life and his writings to be a great challenge. Dr. Cook was converted under the ministry of Oswald J. Smith, 1949, that great mission in McQuiston Presbyterian Church. Uh, I learned recently that Dr. Bill Woods also attended that mission. He wasn't converted at it, but uh, the Lord began to speak to him, began to work in his heart uh, of his need of Christ. Uh, Dr. Oswald J. Smith said that the day that he was ordained to the gospel ministry, he read the entirety of the pastoral epistles, all of First and Second Timothy and Titus. So I, w I was challenged about that on, on the day of my ordination, uh, the 8th of November, 1994. I uh, set aside the time to read through them uh, as a challenge uh, to my own heart uh, as well. So we are going to read just a little of First Timothy uh, chapter 1. Uh, we're going to begin uh, to read just there at, at the ninth verse. And we'll read down to the end of the chapter. We'll break in to the first chapter at that place. 
1 Timothy 1, verse 9, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, uh, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed uh, to my trust. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he hath counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Ending our reading there tonight, the close of uh, that chapter. And we pray the Lord will follow tonight with his blessing uh, the public reading of his word. We do bid you all uh, warmly welcome to the Lord's house this Sabbath evening, uh, the evening of Reformation Day. We're, we're thankful for your presence. We're very glad to see all that have been able to come and join with us uh, for the gospel service uh, this Sunday evening. I uh, want to pray that the Lord will bless us, uh, the Lord will be with us uh, in the service tonight. We'll know his presence and we'll be conscious of his help just uh, in every part. Remember the meetings in the will of the Lord through the week uh, that lies ahead. Uh, Tuesday night, uh, keep in mind that the bright hour in Killalay is off this week. There's been a, a difference between the two meetings because of the difference of when uh, the half-term holidays have been taken in the various schools. So the Killalay Bright Hour is off uh, this week uh, for half-term, and the Bright Hour here in the church is back again uh, this coming Tuesday night at a quarter to seven. So please make that known. Remember that the workers, uh, the leaders in each of the Bright Hours uh, will be glad of your help just in making the meetings known and uh, doing all you can to encourage children to come along. Wednesday night at 8, our midweek service, uh, we did emphasize this morning the importance of the midweek meeting, uh, the times of prayer. Uh, we encourage you, if it's at all possible, come along on Wednesday night. We need to pray for the church, need to pray for the gospel witness, pray for our land at, at this time. I hope to be here to lead and preach at that service. We're in a mini-series on the gates of Jerusalem, especially the message of the gates of uh, Jerusalem. So please uh, remember the midweek service, the radio broadcast uh, on Wednesday afternoons at three o'clock uh, on Radio Star Country. 
Remember Friday night, the meeting of the Youth Fellowship. I want to encourage all of uh, the young people of the church to come along. Uh, the speaker this Friday night is Miss Hannah Carson, one of the recently appointed uh, youth leaders. So remember Hannah in your prayers as she prepares that message that the Lord will guide her. And we, we invite and urge uh, all the young people to come along uh, to the youth meeting Friday evening. The, the service is next Lord's Day. Uh, tomorrow brings us into November. Next Lord's Day, the 7th of November, the Sunday school and Bible classes in the morning at 10.40, morning worship 11.30, the evening gospel service at half past six. Remember that, that is going to be a special dedication service. Little Annie Grace Quinn, her dedication will be conducted uh, during the service. And we're looking forward to that and also to some visitors uh, from the Quinn and the Gibson families who will be joining us to give support uh, to Richard and Grace and uh, the families. Remember all of the meetings uh, next Lord's Day planned to be with us. Take it upon your heart uh, to bring all of your family with you, encourage them out and uh, bring others uh, to hear the message of the gospel. Remember the special memorial service being held in the Hebron Church in Balamone this Thursday night at 8 o'clock. That's in memory of our late beloved uh, brother, Dr. Uh, Alan Cairns. Uh, this Friday will mark a year from his uh, home calling. So there's going to be various tributes, uh, various folk that will be participating uh, in that service. Uh, everyone is welcome to attend. It is uh, an open meeting. Uh, the Balamone congregation have made that clear and want it to be made clear uh, to our congregations. If you're not able to go up uh, to Balamone, you can still join the service. It is going to be, in the will of the Lord, streamed uh, live uh, online. So remember that you can watch and participate uh, in that manner. Keep in mind the list in the porch uh, of the senior citizens of uh, the congregation, just in preparation uh, for Christmas and the distribution of the, the Christmas gift uh, among the senior members of the congregation, just to remind you of the age group, uh, ladies 60 and over, gentlemen 65 and over. So please take a wee look at the list. If your name needs to be added or a member of your family uh, needs to be added, please do that as soon as possible or speak to our brother and sister Wesley and Laura. They kindly look after that matter for us uh, from year to year. We just want to be sure in putting out the list and asking for names to be added, we just want to be sure uh, that everyone receives the Christmas gift who's entitled uh, to receive it from the congregation as a, an acknowledgement and an encouragement of their faithful support of, of the work here. Remember the literature. Take a time to look at the tables as you leave, especially uh, the LTBS literature that recently came and remember that their calendar uh, for 2022 you may like one for yourself, would make a good gift. As well, at the Christmas time, uh, those are priced uh, £3.50 each. Just to highlight again those that have uh, been bereaved uh, in recent days, our, our sister, Mrs. Lily Crane, in the death of her cousin, uh, Mervyn, uh, Mrs. Gillian Moore, uh, down in Enniskillen, her mother-in-law, Mrs. Moore, and we highlighted as well this morning, the Reverend Dean. Uh, just in the, the home calling of his, his father. So we commend uh, all of these folk uh, to you, their family circles as well, as their hearts are sad and as they grieve uh, the loss uh, of dear ones. Just to ask if the members of committee that are present tonight could wait just for uh, a couple of minutes at the close of the service, uh, please. We're going to sing uh, our second hymn just at this time, 203. I was sinking deep in sin, sinking to rise no more, overwhelmed by guilt within, mercy I did implore. Then the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, Christ my Saviour lifted me, now safe am I. 203, and we'll stand to sing, please.
Let's just bow together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to praise Thee for the greatness of Your love towards us. Remember that verse that's so well known, that for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. We thank You for Calvary. Thank You for the death, the sacrifice of Thy Son there. We thank You, Father, for the greatest demonstration of love that this world of ours has ever known. And we want to praise Thee that we have known, experienced, our lives have been touched uh, by Your love towards us. We want to thank You, Father, that You reached down and lifted us from our sins. Remember the psalmist said, You took us from the fearful pit and from the mary clay, and on the rock You set our feet, establishing our way. And Lord, we want to pray uh, that even the love of God might go out across this city and those that are hardened in their sins, that their hearts might be melted and, and brought to Christ in salvation. Lord, our prayer is that you'll raise Lazarus in this city. We want to ask that those that are notorious for their sins, we want to pray, Father, that the greatest sinners in this city and in this community of ours, that their lives will be changed and transformed, and that you'll make them new creatures in Christ Jesus. So, Father, hear our prayers. Come and touch us now. We confess that we need the Holy Spirit to come upon the preaching of your word. And we plead, Father, that that will be evident even in the service tonight. Give utterance to make known the mystery of the gospel. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to ask you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Our text tonight is the 15th verse of that portion. 1 Timothy 1 verse 15, where the apostle says, This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. And it's especially the words at the end of the verse that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. We're going to think a little tonight of the life of Thomas Bilney, uh, one of the most notable of the the reformers uh, of Reformation times. We're going to think especially of uh, the conversion, how the Lord in his grace and providence brought uh, Thomas Bilney to Christ. Just to point out to you that Thomas Bilney was like Zacchaeus that we read off in the Scriptures. Thomas Bilney was a man who was little of stature. In fact, he's affectionately known in the accounts, the records of church history as Little Bilney uh, because of that fact. But even though that he was small physically, he was a man who was a giant uh, spiritually. He was a man that was mightily used of God in the, the very short life, the very short space of time that he was here upon this earth. And his memory uh, lingers long to us, even down the centuries uh, to this very night. Uh, in bringing a message like this to you, let me remind you, we want to encourage you to think of these things. We want to encourage you to read some of these accounts, read some of these life stories in a little more detail uh, yourself. In a place in Cambridge, the city of Cambridge, known as the White Horse Inn, that that might sound a little strange, it seems a a very unlikely place that a work would be done uh, for God, but it was. So in the White Horse Inn in Cambridge City, that is where Thomas Bilney did one of the greatest works of his life. Uh, while he was here upon this earth. Uh, The White Horse Inn was the meeting place of scholars. It was the meeting place of professors from the university. The reason why they met there uh, was because they were able there to talk about subjects that they were prohibited to talk about and speak about in the classrooms of the university. Thomas Bilney brought his copy of the New Testament Scriptures Uh, to the White Horse Inn, and the results of all that they discussed 
and the great truths that they talked about together, the results of those meetings were staggering. There were many who were converted to Christ in that place, including some of the leaders of Cambridge University at that time. Men like George Stafford and Robert Barnes were converted uh, through those gatherings that Thomas Bilney convened. Other great men were attracted to the White Horse and to, to get involved in those discussions, to hear the truths that were being spoken about. Men like William Tyndale, John Frith, Matthew Parker. Remember, Matthew Parker became uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, Matthew Parker, that expression, Nosy Parker, uh, he's the man that that expression is named after. And yes, he was a very nosy man, and that's the reason why he was given that description. But those are names that you should know. Those are stories that every Christian should be uh, familiar with. And they were all part of those debates. They were all part of those discussions in the White Horse Inn. That, that White Horse Inn was nicknamed Little Germany. The reason for that was because Martin Luther and his writings and his teachings, all that Luther was doing, all that he was writing, all that he was preaching, th those things were so often uh, discussed uh, there in that little place. The fact is, men and women, the Reformation in England, the Reformation in Britain and its development in this land and across the land owes much to what Thomas Bilney did in the White Horse Inn in Cambridge. Thomas Bilney was a great soul winner, and he showed great zeal. In fact, he showed great wisdom in the winning of souls to Christ. One of the most notable souls that he won to the Lord during his lifetime was Hugh Latimer. Hugh Latimer was one of the great reformers, member burnt at the stake. Hugh Latimer, like Thomas Bilney, was training to be a Roman Catholic priest. But after his conversion, Bilney saw the ability of Latimer. He saw his fervency. He saw that Hugh Latimer uh, was a great speaker. And he thought of the great asset that he would be to the cause of the Reformation if he was converted to Christ. So he set out to win Hugh Latimer uh, to the Savior. And you know where Thomas Bilney won Hugh Latimer? He won him in the confessional box. That, that's where he showed great wisdom. He went along to the confessional box and he said to, the, to Hugh Landmer, who was the priest on the other side of the box, I have a confession to make unto thee, uh, Father. And he said, say on, my son. And he started to give to Hugh Latimer his testimony in the confessional box of how God reached down, of God's saving grace in his life. So Thomas Bilney was a, a much-used soul winner. And that should be a challenge to us, brethren and sisters, that the Lord would use you and I in that way uh, as well. After his studies at university, Th Thomas Bilney began to preach. In those Reformation times, he preached mainly against popery, denouncing saint worship and holy relics and all the unscriptural doctrines and dogmas of the Church of Rome. Inevitably, because he preached so clearly and forcefully against those things, he was arrested and he was taken and imprisoned in the Tower of London. He was placed there under great pressure. And that pressure, after a time, uh, it broke him. It broke his resolve. And Thomas Bilney signed a recantation of his faith. He was forced to go and listen to a sermon denouncing Protestant doctrine. He was forced to light a fire under a stack of William Tyndale's uh, copy or translation of the New Testament scriptures. And after those things took place, they shattered him. It left him almost demented. He, he was totally broken and grieved in his own soul about what he had done. And he resolved in his heart that he was going to get arrested again so that he could make a clear and firm and faithful stand for God and for the truth of the gospel. And that's what happened. He was arrested a second time. And the consequence, the outcome, the result of being arrested the second time was he was burnt at the stake. He was martyred for the faith of the gospel. 
on the 19th of August, 1531. So in August past, that was 490 years ago, and he was just 36 years of age at the time. Whenever they led him out to the stake, he ran and he embraced it. And he thanked God for the privilege of a second opportunity that was given or afforded to him to die for Christ and the gospel. But let me tell you, men and women, most of all tonight, let me tell you how uh, Thomas Bilney was converted. Like William Tyndale, Thomas Bilney was converted in the university itself. He was studying canon law. He was preparing himself for the priesthood of the Roman Catholic Church. And he was zealous, very zealous. In fact, there have been few more zealous in religion than, than Thomas Bilney. He faithfully pa- fasted. He did penance regularly. He bought indulgences. Remember that indulgences, the sale of them, was at the very heart of what Martin Luther wrote in his 95 Theses, how unscriptural, how wicked that system of indulgences was, the sale of the forgiveness of sins. But at the end of all that Thomas Bilney did, he had no money. That's the result of it. He had no health. And worst of all, he had no peace. He had no peace either with himself or with God. And this is what Thomas Bilney believed. He believed that every generation had a Judas. In other words, a person for whom there was no hope. A person who could not be saved. And Thomas Bilney, after all that he had gone through in religion and found no peace, he thought that he was the Judas Iscariot of his generation. And he decided as he thought about those things that if he was going to go to hell, he might as well go to hell for a good reason. So he went out and he bought a copy of the New Testament Scriptures. Remember that to this very day is still on the list of forbidden books by the Roman Catholic Church. So he went out and he bought himself a copy. He bought it on the black market. That was the only way he could get a copy of the New Testament Scriptures in those days. He went back to his room, and he sat down and he began to read. And as he read the Word of God for the very first time in his life, he was both thrilled and he was also stunned by the message that was before him. He started to read through that New Testament, chapter by chapter, book by book, And then he came to these words that's before us tonight. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. And that truth, that he came to save sinners, that he came to save the chief of sinners, well, that truth came like an arrow to his heart. And that very night in his own room, he was converted on the spot, and his life was turned upside down. The chief of sinners saved. That men and women was the truth that brought Thomas Bilney uh, to Christ. He thought to himself, if the chief of sinners can be saved, well, then that means that I can be saved as well. And, And that touched his heart. That enlightened his mind as far as the great truth and the invitation of the gospel was concerned. And I want you to know, men and women, tonight, that so can you. If the chief of sinners, if Thomas Bilney himself could be saved, then so can you, whoever you are and whatever your sin uh, might be. This text of Scripture, it sets before us this truth, men and women, how wide the gate of salvation is, how wide the invitation of the gospel is, It teaches us very plainly and clearly that no one, not even the greatest of sinners, is beyond the pale and beyond the invitation of God's so great uh, salvation. We want you to know tonight, we want you to see, as you ponder the words of this glorious text of gospel scripture that is before you, that His grace is sufficient to save uh, even you. You think of it, Paul, the chief of sinners, he certainly was guilty of wicked sins. He he lists, he speaks of some of them, even in this chapter that we have read from tonight. But when he wrote uh, these words, 
he may not necessarily have thought himself of the, uh, as the greatest sinner ever. It was an expression of how deeply he felt his sin when God began to work in his heart and brought him to Christ in salvation. But having said that, men and women, what I want to do just uh, for the, the few minutes that remain of this meeting tonight is I want to mention to you some who are the chief of sinners, some who are the, the scarlet sinners of society, the scarlet sinners of this world, but can be saved and can be brought uh, to Christ for mercy and forgiveness. You think of uh, the blasphemer. If you look there at verse uh, 13, who was before a blasphemer, he's telling you about himself. Look at the very final statement of the chapter, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Just think of blasphemy. Think of wicked language. Think of foul and sin sinful language. Strictly speaking, blasphemy is to speak against, and especially to speak against the Savior. The Lord Jesus taught when he was here on earth, whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man. Well, that's a scriptural description or definition of what blasphemy is, to speak a word or words against the Son of Man. I wonder if you ever done that. Could it be there might be a, a blasphemer listening to this message tonight? You know, there are even blasphemers in so-called church circles, especially in ecumenical uh, church circles. Some of you will remember the name of Donald Soper, was the, the president of uh, the Methodist Federation of Churches, uh, going back maybe to the, the 1950s. He and his preaching, remember a church leader, so-called, said that Christ was illegitimate. You think of the Unitarian churches that you find across our land. Unitarian churches don't believe in the Trinity. We are Trinitarian. We believe in Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, three persons in one. Unitarians just believe in one person. They deny the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ, deny the fact that he was God, uh, the Son of God, and God the Son. Mr. Nicholson very strongly spoke against the Unitarians, described them as the half-damned on bloody Unitarians for the very reason that their creed is a blasphemy. It speaks against uh, Christ our Savior. You know John Bunyan, what a preacher he became. John Bunyan before conversion was a foul-mouthed man. In fact, his language was so disgraceful, so appalling, that he told himself in his testimony afterwards, a loose woman of the town rebuked him, rebuked him. He was taken back that a woman of her character would rebuke him, but she rebuked him for his language and said that his language would profane the whole parish. His language was such, he was a blasphemer, the chief of sinners. But I want you to know, men and women, even a blasphemer can be saved, can be converted. The Savior said, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven uh, unto men. So the chief of sinners, blasphemy. You think of sodomy. Uh, you look again at the chapter. It's amazing what this chapter contains. Look at verse 10. It says, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and that there be any other thing that is contrary uh, to sound doctrine. Look at those words at the beginning of the verse, for whoremongers and for them that defile themselves uh, with mankind. Do you know there's some people who want you to believe there's no mention of sodomy in the New Testament Scriptures. We would have to reply to that they must never have read the Scriptures of the New Testament Scriptures. Here's a verse that speaks of immorality. Here's a verse, men and women, that speaks about extreme immorality. It especially names a sodomy. The world would want you to believe today. They would say that a so sodomy is not wrong. Sodomy is not a sin. Notice carefully what God says in this 10th verse. God says, it defiles. It is a sin. For them that defile themselves 
uh, with mankind. Do you remember what Paul said? Writing to the Corinthian believers, he described it as abusers of themselves with mankind. Abuse is a major subject that we hear about today, especially uh, child abuse, how awful, how wicked that is. But here's those who abuse themselves, abuse themselves with mankind. Remember what Paul said in the book of Romans, that it is that which is against nature. Judas in his epistle described it as strange flesh. So make no mistake about it. Make no mistake, men and women. Sodomy is wrong right throughout the Scriptures, right throughout the New Testament Scriptures. Sodomy is something that is sinful. In fact, it's, it has to be described as very sinful. Think of uh, what is said in the book of Genesis, the, the very text, the very reference in the providence of God is significant. Genesis 13, verse 13. The men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Is not clear enough and strong enough? The men of Sodom, because of their immoral practices, they were wicked. They lived wicked lives. They were sinners, and they were sinners before the Lord, and they were sinners before the Lord exceedingly. So I want you to see that, so that Sodomites, men and women, they're amongst the chief of sinners. That brought the fire of heaven down upon Sodom and Gomorrah. That brought the supernatural intervention of God upon those cities and upon this earth in the most singular manner. But remember that even Sodomites can be saved. Because in that passage where Paul identified the Sodomites as those that were abusers of themselves with mankind, he said, and such were some of you, but ye are washed. There's power in the Savior's blood, even the cleanse uh, from this awful sin. I want you to say as well, not only blasphemy, sodomy, you think of murder as among the chief of sinners. Look there at verse 9 of the chapter, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers. Isn't it true that even today other crimes have been softened, our attitude towards them has been softened, but murder is still seen as a heinous crime. Remember there's all types of murder. Think of child murder, so prominent in the news today uh, with all uh, the emphasis that our government is seeking to place upon pushing abortion through in this province of ours. Think of the child murder in Egypt when the children that were born were cast into the Nile. Think of the child murder in Bethlehem at the time of the birth of the Lord Jesus when Herod sent his soldiers into that town to, to kill all the children uh, from two years old uh, and under. You think of mass murder. Think of the Holocaust during the Second World War. Uh, the, the murder, uh, th that uh, whole program of the Nazi regime against the Jews, six, or six million Jewish souls that were slaughtered uh, at that time. You think of self-murder. Remember, that's what suicide is. How serious a problem that is becoming in our land and across the land. You think of the murder of parents. That's especially what Paul is referring to there at the end of verse 9. Murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers. It's not an awful crime, men and women. It's not a scarlet sin to take the life of the one who under God in this world actually gave, your, gave you life. You think of way back in California, 1989. Some of you maybe remember the story in the news of the Menendez brothers. Two, two sons went in and murdered their own parents. The, the mother's face, they killed the father first. And when the mother saw what they had, their, her own sons had done to the father and were just about to do to her, there was an expression of absolute horror that was fixed on her face after death. Murder. The murder of fathers and mothers. The mother of parents, or the murder of parents. A wicked sin. 
Remember that it was for murder that the Lord took Judah into exile. It was because of murder, uh, because of Manasseh, and that he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood. So I want you to see, men and women, murder is an awful sin. But remember that the greatest murder of all was the death of Christ. Stephen, when he was preaching before the Jewish Sanhedrin, Stephen described the Jews as of whom you were the betrayers and murderers. He actually used the word. He, he left us in no, un, no doubt, told us in no uncertain terms that the Jews were guilty of murder. It was in the plan of God. Of that there was no doubt. God and his sovereignty had planned it from all eternity. But that did not take away from the guilt of those that were responsible for what happened to the Savior that day at Calvary. Peter, preaching on the day of Pentecost, we made reference to that sermon this morning, but Peter, preaching on the day of uh, Pentecost, said, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. So there's the plan of God from all eternity. Christ went to the cross because he was delivered. It was in the decrees, the, the, the purposes uh, of God from all eternity. But he went on to say, ye with wicked hands have crucified and slain. The Jewish people were especially guilty of his death. They said, his blood be upon us and upon our children. And so it has been. That's one reason why they have suffered so much uh, down through the centuries. So murderers among the chief of sinners. But even a murderer even the murderers of Christ can and have been saved, been brought to Christ in repentance and in forgiveness of all of their sins. There's one other I'll mention to you. That is uh, the unbeliever. If you look there at the end of verse 13, who before was a blasphemer and persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. It might surprise you tonight to add unbelief uh, to a list such as this. It may seem strange to place an unbeliever in a list of the chief of sinners. But being no doubt, men and women, that uh, the unbeliever, the unrepentant, is among the chief of sinners. In Revelation chapter 1, there's a list that is given there of all who will have their part in the lake of fire that burneth forever and forever. In that list you will read of murderers, you will read of whoremongers, you will read of sorcerers. It is a, a solemn list to read, but it also mentions the fearful and the unbelieving. And the fearful and unbelieving are mentioned before the murderers, whoremongers, and sorcerers. So if order is anything to go by, that means that this is the chief of sins. It's right up there at the very top of the list. Do you remember what the Savior said? He said it would be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment. Imagine that. We have described to you already tonight how heinous, how awful a sin sodomy is. But the Lord Jesus said it would be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for Capernaum, the city of Capernaum, up there in northern Israel. Why is that? Why would Capernaum experience a greater judgment? Why would they be consigned to a deeper, more awful place in hell than the cities of Sodom and the inhabitants of it? Well, remember, Capernaum wasn't a wicked city. Wicked city in the sense of gross sin, as we view it, but they had heard Christ preach. They had experienced the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one of whom the Bible says, never man spake like this man. They had witnessed his miracles, but despite all of that, they still would not repent. They would still would not come to him. They still would not believe the message of the gospel. And that's why the Savior said it would be more tolerable uh, for Sodom, that their punishment would not be 
as great. That teaches us, men and women, unbelief, not trusting Christ, not repenting of your sin and trusting Him as your Savior. That's a far greater sin. If you have been blessed with the message of the gospel, blessed with the light of God's Word, blessed greatly with those things, that's a far greater sin even than the sin of sodomy itself. Can I ask, are you guilty of it? Are you among the fearful and unbelieving? If you are, then let me plead with you to come, come tonight, and trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. So the chief of sinners, what a text this is. What a blessing. What an encouragement to all to come and receive Christ as their Savior. And if you're a sinner tonight, if you fall into the category of being a great sinner, then what we want to tell you is that there's a great Savior. There's a great salvation. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and he came to save the chief of sinners. There's a great Savior, and we want to point you to him, we want to point you tonight to none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. That salvation can be yours tonight if you will just come and take Jesus Christ as your Savior. So this was the text, men and women, that brought the reformer Thomas Bilney to Christ, that brought him into the light of the gospel. And I pray it might do the same for you on the evening of this Reformation Day in the year 2021. This is a faithful say, worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. 314, please. Just a couple of verses we'll finish with. My happy soul rejoices, the sky is bright above. I'll join the heavenly voices and sing redeeming love. Think of the chorus, for there's power in Jesus' blood. Power in Jesus' blood. There's power in Jesus' blood to wash me white as snow. Verses 1 and 4, please, they're in keeping with our message tonight. The hymn 314, the verses 1 and 4, and we'll stand as we sing. Let's just bow together and seek the Lord. Father, we lift our hearts to Thee. We seek Your face at the close of this service. Pray that the Spirit of God will apply the Word. We want to pray, Father, that You'll speak on through the message. We want to thank You tonight for the greatness of Your grace. We want to thank You for the greatness of Thy salvation. Remember the book of Hebrews tells us how shall we escape if we neglect uh, so great salvation. We thank you for our, our great Savior. We thank you for the Lord Jesus, the one who is the only mediator between God and men. We want to pray, Father, that the message of the gospel will be blessed in this land. We pray that you'll use the word that has been preached tonight. We ask, Father, it might be owned of God to the winning of souls. 
And Lord, we think of uh, the, the great sin committed across our land, the great sinners. But we thank you for the message you've given to us. We pray for boldness and power to proclaim that message, even in the days in which we live. And Lord, as the reformers were faithful in their day, even some of them faithful unto death, we want to pray, Father, give us the grace, the courage that is needed to be faithful for Christ in our day, like David of old, to serve our own generation according to the will of God. So here are prayers. And Lord, as we go out this week, let us go out in the fullness of the Holy Ghost and let us live and labor in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. So answer these are prayers. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all for Jesus' sake.